Chapter 5 In 1880, Benjamin Button was 20 years old, and he signalized his birthday by going to work for his father in Roger Button & Company Wholesale Hardware. It was in that same year that he began going out socially. That is, his father insisted on taking him to several fashionable dances. Roger Button was now 50, and he and his son were more and more companionable. In fact, since Benjamin had ceased to dye his hair, which was still greyish, they appeared about the same age and could have passed for brothers. One night in August, they got into the phaeton, attired in their full dress suits, and drove out to a dance at the Chevlin's country house, situated just outside of Baltimore. It was a gorgeous evening. A full moon drenched the road to the lustreless color of platinum, and late blooming harvest flowers breathed into the motionless air aromas that were like low, half heard laughter. The open country, carpeted for rods around with bright wheat, was translucent as in the day. It was almost impossible not to be affected by the sheer beauty of the sky. Almost. There's a great future in the dry goods business, Roger Button was saying. He was not a spiritual man. His aesthetic sense was rudimentary. Old fellows like me can learn new tricks, he observed profoundly. It's you, youngsters, with energy and vitality that have the great future before you. Far up the road, the lights of the Chevlin's country house drifted into view. And presently there was a sighing sound that crept persistently toward them. It might have been the fine plaint of violence, or the rustle of the silver wheat under the moon. They pulled up behind a handsome brougham whose passengers were disembarking at the door. A lady got out, then an elderly gentleman, then another young lady, beautiful as sin. Benjamin started. An almost chemical change seemed to dissolve and recompose the very elements of his body. A rigor passed over him, Blood rose into his cheeks, his forehead, and there was a steady thumping in his ears. It was first love. The girl was slender and frail, with hair that was a sheen under the moon and honey-colored under the sputtering gas lamps of the porch. Over her shoulders was thrown a Spanish mantilla of softest yellow, butterflied in black. Her feet were glittering buttons at the hem of her bustle dress. Roger Button leaned over to his son. That, he said, is young Hildegard Moncrief, the daughter of General Moncrief. Benjamin nodded coldly. Pretty little thing, he said indifferently. But when the Negro boy had led the buggy away, he added, Dad, you might introduce me to her. They approached a group of which Miss Moncrief was the center. Reared in the old tradition, she curtsied low before Benjamin. Yes, he might have a dance. He thanked her and walked away, staggered away. The interval until the time for his turn should arrive dragged itself out interminably. He stood close to the wall, silent, inscrutable, watching with murderous eyes the young bloods of Baltimore as they aided around Hildegard Moncrief, passionate admiration in their faces. How obnoxious they seemed to Benjamin, how intolerably rosy. Their curling brown whiskers aroused in him a feeling equivalent to indigestion. But when his own time came, and he drifted with her out upon the changing floor to the music of the latest waltz from Paris, His jealousies and anxieties melted from him like a mantle of snow. Blind with enchantment, he felt that life was just beginning. You and your brother got here just as we did, didn't you? Asked Hildegard, looking up at him with eyes that were like bright blue animal. Benjamin hesitated. If she took him for his father's brother, would it be best to enlighten her? He remembered his experience at Yale, so he decided against it. It would be rude to contradict a lady. 
it would be criminal to mar this exquisite occasion with the grotesque story of his origin. Later, perhaps. So he nodded, smiled, listened, was happy. I like men of your age, Hildegard told him. Young boys are so idiotic. They tell me how much champagne they drink at college and how much money they lose playing cards. Men of your age know how to appreciate women. Benjamin felt himself on the verge of a proposal. With an effort, he choked back the impulse. You're just the romantic age, she continued. Fifty. Twenty-five is too worldly wise. Thirty is apt to be pale from overwork. Forty is the age of long stories that take a whole cigar to tell. Sixty is... Um, Oh, sixty is too near seventy. But fifty is the mellow age. I love fifty. Fifty seemed to Benjamin a glorious age. He longed passionately to be fifty. I've always said, went on Hildegard, that I'd rather marry a man of fifty and be taken care of than marry a man of thirty and take care of him. For Benjamin, the rest of the evening was bathed in a honey-colored mist. Hildegard gave him two more dances, and they discovered that they were marvelously in accord on all the questions of the day. She was to go driving with him on the following Sunday, and then they would discuss all these questions further. Going home in the phaeton just before the crack of dawn, when the first bees were humming and the fading moon glimmered in the cool dew, Benjamin knew vaguely that his father was discussing wholesale hardware. And what do you think should merit our biggest intention after hammers and nails? The elder button was saying. Love, replied Benjamin absent-mindedly. Lugs, exclaimed Roger Button. Why, I've just covered the question of lugs. Benjamin regarded him with dazed eyes, just as the eastern sky was suddenly cracked with light and an oriole yawned piercingly in the quickening trees. <laughs>